How are you doing? Great. Great. Oh yeah, we gotta set up the timer. Hold on. We'll have we'll have problems. We'll miss the Packer game. Yeah, I know it's not today. It's kind of funny though. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, so uh, the passage today. Um, fun one, yeah. Um, so, here's an interesting thing. So, um, just so everybody knows that I'm appropriately feminist and, non, and non-gender biased, I took my two girls shooting high-powered rifles last night. Um, I'm totally a feminist, especially when it encouraged them to get involved in my hobbies, okay? And <clears throat> we had to drive out into the country and hang out with a family in the church because apparently um, setting up a high-powered makeshift rifle range at Elver Park is frowned upon at this establishment. <laughs> And so we drove out to this family that lives out in the country a little ways. And um, I taught her something. Then we had like pizza for dinner. And so we went, I was sitting on the porch eating pizza and the adults were talking. And I made some joke with the mom and wife in the family that um, I could use a little help in my sermon if she'd be happy to help. And she was like, sure, what, what passage are you doing? I was like, oh, the one in Colossians that starts out, wives submit to your husbands. And, she, and, she, and so her, here's her response. She burst out laughing. <laughs> because... That's clearly a joke, right? I mean, if you're joking about somebody preaching a sermon or anyone that doesn't normally do that, and you want to make them feel maximally uncomfortable, which is, of course, funny, you would, of all the passages in the Bible, choose this one, right? Um, In addition to that, during this week, knowing that I was going to talk about this passage, I had a number of conversations with women who are Christians, and I asked them, what's your advice on what I should say and shouldn't say? when I preached a sermon. And um, of the three that I had more substantive conversations with, there is one thing that they all said they did want to hear about, and one thing that they said that I definitely shouldn't say. The, the thing that they said that they all wanted to hear about is they said, you know, I really have always kind of wondered what the word submit really means anyway. And the second thing that they all said is you definitely should not say, wives, you need to submit to your husbands. At which point, I was wondering what I was going to do with the other 50 minutes of my sermon. (laughs) After I defined a word that we all know what it means, and then didn't say the one imperative in the passage that it actually tells me to say. So, because, however though, I respect the wisdom of the women in my life, especially my wife, and so in order not to go against the advice I was given, I'm actually going to preach on that next week. (laughs) Because... I actually think that the passage works better if we work from the end of the passage back forward. This whole section is referred to in New Testament literature as a household code. Like how, how does a household run? There's one in Ephesians, there's one here in Colossians, there's a couple others, one in First Peter, and, and, and there are a number of them in literature outside the Bible. But the ones in the Bible are very different from the ones outside the Bible, and I'm going to talk more about that next week. The reason why I want to move backwards through this is for a couple of reasons. One is... Um, well, three reasons. One is to get men to come back to church next week. <laughs> Sorry, that was a joke. The second, <laughs> the second um, one is, is that Christians get attacked all the time for how the Bible talks about slavery, which is, of course, the second half of this passage. And um, you need to know how to deal with that, how to think about that, and I want to help you do that. So I'm going to spend a considerable amount of time on that. And third, one of the the issues that comes out of this is the fact that the God that exists is a God of order in a way that we in modern, late American culture are extremely uncomfortable with. More than the issue of wives submitting to their husbands, we are even more uncomfortable with the idea that there is such a thing as social order that is good and that we should submit ourselves to. It's a very difficult idea for us. And no better example than in an institution that we believe in least. So, now that I clearly have a more difficult sermon than the one on wives, let's give it a try. The first thing I think is important to recognize is without, um, with as much honesty as possible, we need to formulate the argument of the objection to Christian faith based on how the Bible deals with slavery. This is the most um, clear formulation that I can come up with 
um, that I, I think this is fair, okay? One is the Bible supports slavery in that it talks about it without abolishing it. Two, slavery is an absolute— so, Okay, so just so you know, I'm making the argument I would expect to be objected against Christian faith, and that is. This isn't my argument. We're being fair about the objection people make. Does that make sense? Okay. Two, slavery is an absolute indisputable moral evil. Three, Christians believe the Bible is all inspired by God. Therefore, four, God-inspired support of slavery, and therefore, God-inspired support of a moral evil that he—I'm sorry. Moral evil. I'm sorry, that's messed up a little bit. Six is supposed to be—I better come off, off these. Uh, number six is, if someone inspires the support of moral evil, then that person is not maximally good. Okay? If someone supports a moral evil, inspires the support of a moral evil, then that person is not maximally good. Therefore, God is not maximally morally good. Therefore, either God is not maximally morally good, or God did not inspire all of the Bible. If God is not maximally good, then why would we worship a God that's not maximally good? If this part of the Bible is not inspired, then do we know which parts are and are not? If we don't know which parts are and are not, then how can we look at the Bible as a book that's inspired by God and therefore his word? See, how we, see where this is going? And it disintegrates from there. Okay. <clears throat> One of the concepts I believe that every Christian needs to have in their, in their theological vocabulary is the concept of what's called a divine concession— a divine concession. A divine concession is something that God, the divine one, concedes for some reason. Okay? Um, that is as opposed to a divine institution. So a divine concession, like, for example, the way slavery is regulated in the Old Testament. Here's another example that'll take it out of the slavery question. Divorce. In the Bible, Divorce is an institution that is allowed in certain circumstances and is heavily regulated by God that God says explicitly that he hates, right? How does that work? God explicitly says he hates an institution called divorce, and yet, on the other hand, he actually allows it and regulates it. Why would he do that? If he's good and he hates it, why doesn't he just get rid of it? Answer, right? Because human beings are idiots, right? We can't get along with each other. And so we, we destroy and contour and wreck the good divine institution of marriage so badly that in certain situations, God concedes the use of divorce, right? But Jesus says in the Gospels, why did Moses give you that command? Which was, he believed, inspired by God. Why did he do that? He says, it's because your hearts were hard that God allowed you to divorce your wife, he says to the Pharisees in that case, right? What does that mean? It means that after the fall, there are certain institutions that God concedes. They're usually invented by human beings, and then he regulates. If you're going to do it, you have to do it this way, because this is the institution in a completely wrecked world, and there just really isn't a better one right this second for us to use. So let me give you an example in relationship to how the Old Testament, particularly the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, regulate slavery. We— tend to interpret ancient cultures, the technical term for this is anachronistically, that is, outside of the conjunctions of time. We take modern standards and things we think now and things we experience now, and we read them back kind of ignorantly into past cultures, and we go, oh, why did people do this? But you've never lived in the ancient world. You've never lived in 1450 BC, in which your whole nation was a, a group of clans loosely tied together in a tribal system in a subculture of tribes around them that were constantly raiding each other. Now, if you live in a situation where you can't, with walls or F-22s, create national security, if, which is hard for us to even fathom, you lived in a land that wasn't surrounded by enormous thousand-mile oceans, and you actually lived in less than 10-mile proximity with people who wanted to kill you very badly, okay, what are your options? when they attack you every spring and every fall. Every spring and every fall, they're coming, swords, clubs, spear in hand. They're going to try to kill you. They're going to try to steal everything that you grew. They're going to try to steal all of your livestock. They're going to take your wife, or if you're a woman, they're going to take you captive, and God knows what they're going to do to you, and they're going to kill all your male children if they can, and you just got to stop them as best you can. What do you do, right? 
you, you just frankly can't station people all over the countryside. I mean, it's, basic war is you can't defend. Because if you defend your weakest everywhere and they hit you with their full strength wherever they want to, they win. The only way to survive in a situation like that is to go on the offense. You have to go and fight them and win. The problem is, what do you do if and when you win? Now what? You've only got three options, right? Option one, you kill everyone. That's option one. Anybody want to do that one? Okay. Option number two, you say, I hope we've settled this little disagreement. We're going to go home, and I'm sure that this won't, this problem between us will no longer persist. Who wants that one? Yeah. Uh, I would argue that's not a good option either, okay? The only other functional option is that you subjugate that people in a particular way so they can't come and kill you. I mean, just use your brain. There's, there's only so many options here. Now, later on, 500 years after the Torah, when there's iron, it's the first time in human history where there's a very significant distinction in armaments. It's the difference between a country that has an air force and a country that doesn't have an air force. Like, you can let them do what they want. If they come, you'll just shoot missiles at them, right? In a world in which the Philistines, for example, had iron, and they came and they subjugated the Israelites, and they took all their iron weapons, and they took them back to Philistine territory, and they were good. Why? Because everybody knows iron pierces bronze. Are you really going to go out and fight these guys? Of course not, is the answer. In fact, it says, in the time of Joshua, I'm sorry, not Joshua, in the time of Jonathan and King Saul, they were the only ones that had iron weapons, sword and spear, in all Israel. In fact, so bad was Israel's lack of armaments that they actually had to go to the Philistines to sharpen their pruning hooks and their plows. But 500 years before that, before the onset of the Iron Age, everybody had the same weapons. Everybody was shooting sticks and using bronze and... What do you do? You see, you start thinking in those terms and you go, oh, maybe there's some kind of system in which you don't let the people do whatever they want, i.e. come and kill you. Maybe there's some system by which you keep them from doing it, some sort of subjugation that causes them to, in that sense, be submissive, which is the very definition of slavery. Okay? Another one is, what do you do in a society that's pre-industrial with people who aren't economically productive? It's usually about 5 to 10 percent of any human population is dysfunctional in the sense that they really can't take care of themselves, or they won't. What do you do before the Industrial Revolution produces an amount of wealth that you can try to afford an enormous welfare state? Right? Now, generally speaking, the assumption within the clan system was families took care of families. But what happens when families can't take care of families? What happens when the person's either too idiotic that the family doesn't want anything to do with them, or the family doesn't have the wealth because they're just barely eking themselves out the way it is because it's an agrarian society. Then what? Well, you get the exact kind of slavery that exists in the Torah that's heavily regulated in which people who can't take care of themselves are put into an economic system where the, the person who is in charge, the person they're a slave to, has to take care of them legally by, by law. And only for a period of a certain amount of time. When they come out of that, they're given land so they can have a chance to be economically productive again, and so on. Right? A third issue, and I'm not going to spend much time talking about this, not that I haven't said anything offensive already, but one of the problems that's actually dealt with in the Torah is what do you do with an immigrant population that is isn't coming into a country and enjoying its wealth, but not fully assimilating to its laws and ethos? Right? Now that could get really sticky where we are today, isn't it? But this is, but, but you can see this in the Torah. There's, there are differences in the way foreigners who do not become Jews are treated and ways that people who do become Jews are treated, but only slightly. So there are a number of laws in the Torah that says if a person is a foreigner and they don't become a Jew, but they're living amongst your society, they have to obey all your laws and they get all the rights. Except for a few. And a couple of them relate to slavery. Some of the protections that come if you fall into economic hard times, there are somewhat heavier protections given to somebody who's become fully part of the society and become part of that, that Jewish culture and those who have not. 
there's certain protections because that person said, I'm fully part of this society. When you're fully part of the clan society, you're a brother, you're a sister, you're treated slightly better. But if you go through the Torah and look at how foreigners should be treated, it's actually very well. In a number of places it says they're subject to all the penalties and all the rights and privileges of the Jews, except for in a couple places, and one of them relates to slavery. So what happens in the divine concession of slavery? Because in all three of those situations, you just tell me if you understand the context economically, socially, culturally, militarily, and, and the human condition of the human heart and what we do with things, you just tell me in that context if there was something better to do that you know for sure was better. That could actually be instituted and led and happen in a way that wasn't a horrifyingly bloody revolution that would have killed and destroyed many more lives than regulating an institution that already existed. You just tell me. Because a lot of people just snidely just go, oh, they should have done something different. You have no idea what life was like in that time, and you have no idea what other options could have been when there were no social structures, no governmental structures, no homeland, nothing. And so when you go to the Bible, in the Torah, particularly the first five books, there are a number of statements about slavery. You don't have to read very far to find it. Every single one of them is a regulation limiting the power of the slaveholder. Every one. You can do this, but not do that. It can't last for, more than, last for more than seven years. When they're released, they get land holdings so that they can be productive themselves. They, um, if, if, you, if you like a female slave, you can't just rape her. If you want to be there, you have to marry her, and she gets the full standing in the household, including inheritance, money, status, everything. Right? If you beat on somebody and you create any permanent injury of any kind, even the loss of a tooth, they are set free with holdings. And so on. There's just now you still read it and you're like, I still don't think I want to be a slave. But all of the commands are taking this concession, which is agreeably horrible. But here's the thing: in 3500 BC, life was pretty horrible. And God took this institution and he regulated it very heavily. And one of the things he actually judges Israel, the Israelites for a number of hundreds of years later is that they don't follow the rules that he prescribed. In that sense, one of the things Israel gets judged for is their use of slavery because they don't do what God said. Now, one of the things to, I think to recognize when you get into that whole thing is that one of the reasons why that exists in the first place is because God's divine institutions didn't work, because we didn't work them. If we obeyed the creation mandate as people to work as stewards of the earth and to bring out its creative potential in freedom and love towards one another, and if we accepted the divine institution of the human family, and we worked that, remember, listen, um, I love Thomas Paine as much as the next guy, but he was wrong when he said the most fundamental building block of human society was the individual. That is not true. Christians should not believe that. As a legal entity and stuff, I, I recognize its usefulness. But when the Bible begins, it creates, God creates an individual, and he says that's a bad idea. He said it's not good to have just one for him to be alone. He creates a complementary second human being and joins them as one flesh, and then he says, that's good. The fundamental building block of human society isn't the individual. It is the family, according to the first chapters of the Bible. And if human beings embraced with all the divine vigor of the image of God in us, the work that God gave us to do in the world, in its creativity and freedom, and the family as a way of caring for and loving each other in its immediate and extended form, there would be no need for other other things. In fact, that's one of the things that the Old Testament is all about. God gives people a law and no administrators, right? That's part of the, that's part of the joke, right? Here are laws, no king. If every individual person and family just lives according to these laws, you don't need an administration. You don't need a government. That's the joke. It implodes. Right? They don't do it. Why? Because people won't be good. They won't follow the laws. They won't they won't follow the divine institution. The divine institution of, of family, the divine institution of work, the divine institution of Torah, later the divine institution of the church. We won't follow them. 
And yet we get really pissy because God has to then allow these divine concessions that are extraordinarily painful and many times ugly to persist in order that we could survive. And all the while, we get upset because they persist. The problem is we need them because we won't live according to the divine institutions. Okay, let's move on. Part of the things I think to get from this is the reality of the institution of order. One of the things that you'll find before the fall of man, so God's institution of order is not something he does merely in response to sin. If there is an archangel, what does that mean there is among the angels? If arche means ruler or chieftain or head, what is an archangel, right? He's a chief over other angels, right? There's a hierarchical, functional, rule-based system among authority, among the angels. Um, I think a good argument can be made that there was a structure and form of relationships between the genders before the fall. There's clearly a structure in creation. Human beings, animals, created order. There's a structure to, in God above the human beings. There's that whatever. If you think there's, you say, well, there's nothing different between the genders. Fine. Fine. You want to think that? Fine. Still, within the first two chapters before the fall, there's structure to creation that God creates. God created human beings to steward, love, garden, care for, and bring the creative potential out of the world that God made. Why didn't God just bring it on himself? Why didn't God just create cities and stuff that looks like Lord of the Ring movies, like Gondor cities and stuff? I mean, why, why did he do that? Like, God intentionally chose to create a process, a hierarchy, a functionality, and beings that took enjoyment and existed pleasurably in the roles, rules, structures, order, and authority that he created. Order is a gift of God. And in the fallen state, even divine concessions in the regulation of horrible institutions is designed by God to be a grace because it is a generosity better than its alternative. Now, just uh, let me clear— uh, let me go back really quickly for one second to clear something up. When you understand ancient Near East regulated slavery in the first five books of the Bible, you will immediately recognize it is completely different than European transatlantic slavery, right? You'll immediately realize that. Because that had nothing to do with protecting Europe from the hordes of Africa attacking them, did it? It had nothing to do with that. It was an economic model, right? And so once you realize that, you can see how preposterous it was in American culture for people to say, oh, no, the Bible says slavery. That's okay as long as we're nice. And then we won't be, right? But what you also need to recognize is that almost every major American abolitionist in the northern states was a devout Bible-believing Christian. In fact, my undergraduate honors thesis was on um, Central New York abolitionists, Orson Ames and other people you've certainly never heard of, who, and I got copies of their journals, and they would go all over the state and country debating anti-slavery. They were all Orthodox, Biblical, Bible-believing, Christ-exalting Christians, also with some very strange views, but they very clearly saw the difference between biblical, the biblical concession and the New Testament trajectory that we'll talk about in a minute, and the difference between what we were experiencing in America. The, the success of abolition in America had everything to do with Christians. But let me also say this. Mark Knoll, who's one of the most respected evangelical historians in America right now, wrote a book not that long ago, and he said, many Christians asked the question, when did the American public stop listening to the church? When did we really become a nation that essentially separated church and state, where we no longer looked to the pulpits and to the Christians and to the churches for what we should do as a people in terms of policies and actions? And Noel actually argued it was with the outbreak of the Civil War. He said as much as there were Christians on the abolitionist side of things, there were also Christians that would not be persuaded on the pro-slavery side of things. And when the country had to go to war in order to solve that problem, that's when they decided they couldn't rely on the church to solve these questions because the church wouldn't. 
Now, the reason that's important is because when divinely instituted or divinely conceded order doesn't work or falls apart, you get anarchy. And the reason, one of the reasons why order is, is put forward strongly in the Bible is because disorder is even worse. Is order terrible? Absolutely. Is it wasteful? Yes. Is there all kinds of corruption? Uh-huh. Is there rent sinking? Absolutely. But is it a whole lot better than disorder? It's kind of like the people are like, I don't like organized religion. And you're like, okay, so you like disorganized religion? Right? It's kind of— it's like you're not thinking clearly in opposites. And when, when people say, well, I don't like, you know, establishments and institutions and so on, and like, you're like, okay, do you really know what the opposite of that is? Because it's, a, it's usually enormously bloody, enormously terrible, in which you get much more corruption, much more waste. It's awful. Right? And what, what does that produce? It doesn't produce more anarchy. It produces tyranny is what it produces. You get the destruction of institutions, you get disorder, and then it's ruled by the strong. It's the worst for the weak, and then emerging out of that comes some strong man guy who's going to be the new tyrant. Think about uh, the difference between a society that went through enormous social change but maintained order, even pretty bad institutions, mainly of government, and a nation that didn't, France and England, right? Both countries that had very strong mon monarch systems of, of government. Now, in England, they had already made 500 years of Anglo-Saxon um, progress with certain laws and certain things that the rights that people had, but they hadn't gotten rid of the king or anything like that. It hadn't really become any kind of democracy, right? And there was the sense that, like, people weren't getting paid for what they did. Um, it was, a few people were getting rich, and everybody else was getting something bad. The word that came to mind it wasn't appropriate. Um, <laughs> Right? There was, slavery was allowed. I mean, it was just awful. Awful, right? And so the French people said, here's what we'll do. We'll, we'll get rid of the order. We'll get a new order. We'll destroy the present order, and we'll get a new order. And you have the French Revolution. You have people who, in some ways, were mildly sensible, definitely intelligent, like Voltaire, who said idiotic things like, in a hundred years the Bible will be forgotten, but we will live under the reign of reason for a thousand years. They lived under the reign of blood, of innocent people flowing in the streets. A few guilty people and a lot of innocent people. They destroyed an order, tore it down, piles of people starved, wealth didn't get redistributed, people didn't get new opportunities, educational institutions were destroyed, and then you got the rise of Napoleon that dropped all of Europe into a terrible darkness of war. <laughs> Sounds good to me! If you invest in bullets, right? Meanwhile, in England, there was this slow process of a hundred years of— but what started was in the, in the 1720s or so, you got these two people that showed up on the scene, John Wesley and George Whitfield. And they went into the countrysides of England, and they preached the gospel to everybody. They went to—and— one of the things about West, there was there was this one point where um, one of the politicians of Brit Britain was was yelling about Wesley one time, he, and and somebody was like, well, you really don't like John Wesley? He's like, hate John Wesley, and he's like, well, what? What do you hate about John Wesley? And he's like, I was stand. We were there's a meeting, and John Wesley was the speaker, and I went to the meeting. It was in London, and I went up to the front to speak to Mr. Wesley. He's speaking to some old woman. He just kept talking to her like I wasn't even there, just talking to this old woman. Blah, blah, blah. I finally got mad if I just left. Right? Exactly. The difference between Wesley and Whitfield was they didn't give a care <laughs> who you were. They didn't care if you were a coal miner. They didn't care if you were a slave. They didn't care who you were. You were bought by Christ. You could be regenerate and saved by him. If you rejected him, you were going to hell. It didn't matter if you were the king. Or you'd suffered unimaginably in this life through poverty and crime. And you, everybody was a human being, lost in sin, in need of Christ, possessing the divine image, marred and broken, but present and valuable. Everybody was that. And they went through the, all the lands like, this is what people are. This is what people are. Don't you see? 
And what ended up happening was these people started to get saved. Coal miners got saved, politicians got saved, all kinds of people got saved. And they went out to the thing that they did, and they did it differently. But what they didn't do was, Wesley didn't go out to the coal miners and say, listen, this is what we ought to do. Get your pickaxes, and we're going to go up to the Boston station. We're going to haul him out of there, and we're going to throw him in the mine and pour concrete on him. He didn't do that. He preached to the miners. He says, if you're a miner, how would you live in Christ? And then he went and preached to the foreman, and he said, if you're a foreman of these men and women, how should you live in Christ? And it began to bring this reform of the coal industry. He went to the people who ran the prisons. He said, if the, every prisoner you have is bought and paid for by Christ, they possess the divine image, how would you do prisons? If this is what a child is in God's sight, how would, how would we deal with the fact that little kids are getting in coal chimneys and getting black lung before the age of 10? What would we do with that? What would we do with factories? If the people who were in England, slowly, slowly, England changed. Until after a hundred and twenty years, or more, you could argue more like 170, they became the leading nation in terms of doing what was right and reforming institutions and making lives better for people. Was it still terrible? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And then the English do some awful stuff all over the world? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Same British people who went to India and engaged in some fairly nefarious economic practices are the same English people who went there and stopped widows from being burned alive on their husband's funeral pry. It's a mixed up, ugly, difficult, strange, wicked world, which is why you need Christians entering into institutions of divine concession and being willing to personally sacrifice and fight for the Reformation without producing the kind of anarchy that comes from not respecting the fundamental God-given grace of order, even in horrible institutions that are regulated as divine concessions. It's an enormously difficult tension to live in. But if you won't, as a Christian, you'll have ridiculous ideas about human society. You won't know what to do with your own life. You won't be able to do anything that has any moral mixture to it all. Like, for example, you could never serve in the military. It's just too confused a situation, right? Armies are almost by definition a divine concession. Like, we exist to kill people, right? That's a divine concession. Do you need a military? Absolutely. Do you have to use it sometimes? Yup. Is it terrible? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Who wants to give their life to being good at killing people? Who has any kind of moral fiber? Do we want Christians in the military? You better believe it. Absolutely. At the highest levels possible. Same thing with politics. You talk about morally mixed up game, right? Well, well, if then if you're a Christian, you could never be involved in that, right? It's too much of a divine concession. It's too mutually contaminated a thing, right? I mean, how could we, we all we're going to be able to do is be bakers. You know, unless the flour comes from more than 20 miles from here, right? I mean, like, what are we going to do? <laughs> Almost everything that we do has this moral confusion to it. Almost everything we work in is a divine concession on some level. And if you don't understand the importance of order and how order functions in God's creative world and in his redemptive purpose, you're just simply going to hate everybody in charge of everything. You're never going to be able to lead anything well. You can't really contribute to the society in a way that can be embraced socially by people who are in orders in societies and institutions. You just can't do anything. And what likely will happen is you'll get used as a pawn to create anarchy so that somebody can create their tyranny. And we have to recognize that one of the ways around this is God calls us to simultaneously absolutely affirm the right orders of the world. It says, it says I think it's in 1 Timothy chapter 2, submit to every institution instituted among men. That's crazy, right? Romans 13, submit to government because it is, because God put it there and God appointed it. He wrote that in the 50s when Nero was running Rome and burning Christians alive, where Paul would himself be beheaded by the behest of the government. Right? There's this sense of, like, the level at which 
The early Christians were capable of stomaching the reality of authority while bringing enormous reformation to it is a tension that you can only accept if you follow a leader who is divinely king and the one who's willing to lay down his life in self-sacrificial death in order to bring about the redemption of others. You believe in that guy? And you can submit yourself to something terribly evil and give yourself self-sacrificially to its complete redoing. Paul does that in three ways. How are we doing on time? Not too bad. You bored yet? Okay. Just most of you. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> there's three ways that Paul does this that are really important. So one of the questions that you could ask is, okay, now that you say that stuff, let's pretend it's right, Nick. Doesn't the gospel change all that? I mean, if there's these, like, in orders and institutions and so on, I mean, that's how the Greco-Romans lived. They were all like, institution, order, kill everybody who stands against it. I mean, like, when the gospel comes, doesn't the gospel change that? I mean, Jesus was the servant who, like, served everyone. Like, isn't, I mean, it says in Philippians 2 that you should, like, be humble and that your attitude should be that of Christ and who emptied himself and became the servant of all, and we should be like that. I mean, doesn't the gospel undo all this hierarchical, rule-based, structural authority stuff? Right? And the answer is, no, yes, no. It depends on what you mean by that. Let's go get a sandwich. <laughs> All right? <clears throat> right? Uh, because it, in, ver in 3 verse 11, what does he say? He says, for in Christ there's no longer, right? Jew or Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, you know, at the end, which is like a, a horse-riding nomad, person from like the steppes of west south russia and iran right and barbarian Bar you know barbarian is barbarian is everybody's just not a jew or a greek <laughs> it's like a third like greeks are like yeah there's us greeks you say gentiles jews but there's like us greeks and there's like the other people right that's the barbarians right there's there's so there's all of humanity now in three groups right and then he says what slave or free right so what's what on earth is going on here right Four verses earlier, or wait, 11, 18, that's seven verses. So like seven verses earlier or so, <clears throat> he says, there's no longer slavery free in the gospel for Christ is in all. Christ is in all and is in all. If you're a believer in Jesus, then there's no, there's no longer, these, these distinctions don't have material existence. They're gone, right? And you're like, wait a second, um, Paul, seven verses later, you're talking about slaves submitting to their masters and so forth. Um, can you help me with that, right? I mean, that's, do you see the problem? Now, before we talk about that problem, one of the things that absolutely doesn't change is our submission to the divine institutions that aren't divine concessions. The divine institutions of family, the, a marriage between the complementary genders with the intention of passing life on to godly offspring. I don't have the time to defend that biblically, but the first two chapters point to the creation of the family. In Malachi, it says the re God says, the reason I did this is because I wanted godly offspring. I wanted more humans that followed and loved me that I could love and show my glory to forever. That's the, it's a divine institution, right? Work and bringing out the earth's potential is a divine institution, right? And then after Christ's death and resurrection, the creation of the church. Now you can argue that in redemption, it's kind of like a concession because we only need it because people screwed things up, but it's a, it's not an institution we made and then Christ regulated. Jesus made up the church and he regulated it. That's what a divine institution is. God made it up and he regulated it. A divine concession is we made it up and then God regulated it. So, so when the gospel, I mean, think about this. Jesus comes to earth. He lives. He dies. He's raised from the dead. He's about to ascend into heaven. The gospel has come. The gospel is going out. And what does he do? He creates an, <laughs> an institution that has roles and rules and authorities and functionality. He makes an institution so that the gospel can go forward. So the gospel can't mean the eradication of all structure. Yet, when you come to this divine concession, slavery, this is an example of one of the things the Bible does with all divine concessions, and that is this. It respects, at least momentarily, the legitimacy of the order so that it doesn't decline into tyranny and then, or anarchy and then into tyranny. He rec God recognizes that there's a certain blessing of order because disorder is even worse. And then, Certain divine concessions he intentionally begins to destroy now so that human beings can get past them So that they can become obsolete before heaven And slavery is one of them So there's three things that paul does 
that I want to talk about just really quickly. He destroys its legitimacy. He destroys its caricaturing ability to create lack of empathy towards each other. And he builds godliness into both slaves and masters. So in the Greco-Roman world, a lot of people don't know this, but in many eras of the Greco-Roman world, more than half of the total population was slaves. More than half. Many of the major cities. It's one of the reasons why the laws were so brutal. Why you could kill slaves for a lot of different stuff in the Greco-Roman world, because you really couldn't let 50% of the population get out of hand, if you know what I'm talking about, right? And so <clears throat> the church then now, because when you get to Paul now, we're not talking about the Israelites and their divinely instituted society and how, they're, how God is going to regulate slavery among them and how that's going to— we're not talking about, now we're talking about a new society of people within the overarching Greco-Roman world in which half of the people are slaves, they have no control over the laws, and in which if you free a slave, you can be killed for it. Now you've got slaveholders and slaves in the church, more slaves than slaveholders, because it turns out slaves like the good news of the gospel better than people who are firmly grounded in this world. Who would have thought? Right? And now you've got this mixture in the church, and now Paul has to address this reality. How do these people now deal with each other in a world in which if the slaveholders free their slaves, they're gonna get, they can be killed, and in which you've got this enormously brutal system that's brutalizing half the population? What do you, what do you say, right? And the only way any culture can brutalize a people, a large people for a long period of time, the only way you can do that is if they give themselves an ideology that allows them to feel like they morally can. Human beings at bottom believe that they're good, upstanding, and right people. And every, every kind of oppression requires some argument that legitimates it. Right? Aristotle in the Nicomedian Ethics, one of the greatest treatises of the ancient world on ethics. In the section on slavery, Aristotle says, a slave is a living tool, and there can be no more friendship between a slave and a man than there can be between a man and his tool, right? The great ethicist of the ancient world. Now, there's a lot of other things ethically Aristotle writes about that are fabulous, actually. He gets it really right. We still believe it today, and it's wonderful. But, there, but never underestimate the blindness that can come if you have some kind of legitimacy by creating an argument that seems right. And see, one of the first things that Paul does is he, just, he, he undermines the moral legitimacy of slavery. He says, in Christ, no such thing can exist. You can't have a slave and a free in Christ. In Christ, everybody's a slave to righteousness, right? Or sin. Take your pick. He, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, I make myself a slave to all people because when I came to Christ, I laid down my life to serve others. I became a slave like Jesus was a slave. And so he's, he, Paul's free. He's in charge. And he says, I'm a slave. When the people in charge start saying, I'm a slave, and they start acting like it, they start living in prisons and getting shipwrecked and beat to death and stuff like that. When the guys in charge start doing that, people start going, I, how does this hierarchy actually work? You see the problem? The other thing he does, so, and, and I could take you through that, and it's in a number of epistles, and it's in Ephesians and 1 Timothy, and it's in 1 Corinthians, and it's here in Colossians, and there's a number of places where Paul does that, and he destroys the legitimacy. And without that, just without that legitimacy, slavery is already over. It's just a matter of time. Because the minute you can't feel like a good person anymore when you brutalize other people, you're going to have to start backing down. Right? I can't spend time philosophizing about what that is for us right now, but we can't be the church in this cultural moment until we figure it out. There's probably some group of people that a lot of us feel like we have a proper philosophy for treating them in a certain way, and we're wrong. The one I've been struggling with for months is um, when I was in— I'm sorry, I, just give me a second, because this is so important for us right this minute. I'm not saying my struggles. I'm saying this issue where we open our minds a little bit to like, how am I doing that? Because we're doing it. It's part of the fall. I, was, I went down to Bryan College, which is um, a college in Tennessee, and they asked me to come and do like founders lectures, and I went and I did like five talks over three days, and I talked about—it was all about the church. And at the end of this, this African-American student came up to me. Their, their whole student body is about 5% or 7% now white or something like that. And um, this African-American student came up to me. He said, you have, some, you have some time? I said, sure, of course I do. So we sat down, I was, and uh, we talked for a little while, and he said, he just, he gave me his opinion on some things, and I respectfully disagreed with virtually all of them. Okay, 
And then he said, will you just do me a favor? Will you read this new book that just came out called um, The New Jim Crow? And I was like, sure. Um, I'll, I'll look into it. Of course, I'm a busy guy. I didn't really have much intention at that moment to read it. But I plan on you know, getting a look at it, reading a couple of reviews or something, right? But then I had, my family was already in Florida, so I had like this 16-hour drive to Florida, and I have Audible on my phone, so I thought, what's, 70, what's $17? Like, maybe this will really help me. So I download this book. And apart from getting pulled over by an Alabama cop and getting pulled out of my car and everything, because I think he thought I was running drugs because I was in a rental car. Um, really nice guy, though. Um, <laughs> Never put me in cuffs. Um, anyway, uh, but I listened to this book all the way down. And the book is essentially about the idea that um, Jim Crow laws basically subjugated African Americans. And um, the way we execute the drug war now by allowing somebody to be marked a felon for the rest of their life with fairly minor drug offenses, like they have enough pot to make them a felon. That, that actually, it doesn't just put them in jail for a little while. It actually marks them as a felon their whole rest of their life. And it's like they never get free of that. They, I don't know if you realize that. That never used to be the case until modern Europe. Most of the whole history of the world is that you either got killed for it or you had some kind of penalty and then life went on. You didn't get labeled forever. There was like a social label, but there wasn't a fundamental governmental label that made it okay to treat you however they wanted to, right? And that's one of the themes I think I talked about this ago in Les Miserables. Like Jean Valjean, he has this yellow ticket. He has to show everybody and so nobody will treat him like a human being, right? And so this woman, and she's like, not from my persuasion of things academically, and I didn't like her sociological analysis, and a number of all these logical jumps, and I'm like, oh my gosh. But the general theme of it, I know it's right. The general theme, this sort of like, is this system okay? Right? Now, law enforcement is a divine concession that is a great grace of God, right? It's a wonderful grace of God. Do we want to fight a drug war? I, get, pro- I want to fight crime. I mean, I, I mean, I don't want to just be like, well, let's get rid of the police, right? But at the same time, like, what of the divine concession of that that I benefit from do I have a moral argument in my head that makes it okay for me not to care about how somebody else is being mistreated, right? And I'm listening to this book, and I go, I wonder if this is it. I wonder if this is one of the ones for me. I feel the same way about immigration. I feel like there's this huge defined concession of law related to, like, borders and rule of law and people being able to come into your country in the order in which you select them and based on going through a proper legal process and all this. And then you've got this enormous problem of human beings' lives that I feel like I had this argument in my head that because, well, they broke the law, so that's it, right? And I don't have to wade through this, like, ambiguous craziness of, like, what on earth do you do when everything is spinning out of control? And that's all ugly, right? I mean, some of you might leave the church just because I talked about those two things. Right? I mean, that's how people feel. Well, I'm not going to this church if he's not going to toe the line and blah, blah, blah. But, like, those are things that I've thought about. Those happen to be political because I'm a policy wonk and I like economics and blah, blah, blah. So I think about that stuff. For you, it might be, you may have a bigotry towards husbands or wives. You may feel like you can treat employees in a certain way because you're paying them the market rate or because everybody works more than 45 hours now a week. I don't know what it is for you. If you don't think there's anything, I'm, a, I'm concerned for you. I'm concerned for you. We're supposed to be the most humble of people, and we should be so intellectually as well as everything else. And you see, when Paul comes along and he undercuts the legit philosophical legitimacy of slavery, and he destroys it, it's already dead for Christians. It's already gone. Because the minute you grapple with that, what are you going to do? Right? And then he takes it a step further. The second thing is he destroys the caricaturing of the people that you don't want to deal with. So, for example, he says, um, you guys are now related to each other in the church, and he sticks them into this new Jesus-created institution called the church where they have to talk to each other. You might have to sit next to a slave. You might have to sit next to your slave or your master at church. Go to the same communion. They're all drinking out of the same cup. Can you imagine? They're having communion, and there's like one cup of wine, and your slave who's at the bottom of the barrel from some crazy country with all kinds of weird facial tattoos goes up and he drinks, representing the blood of Christ that saved him, and he hands it to you. (laughs) And you're like, maybe I should make his house a little cleaner. (laughs) You see the issue? There's, um, this comes out in a book that people often don't read in the Bible, but you should read it because it's only one page, and then you'll feel like you read a book, you know? It's the book of Philemon. 
a number of biblical scholars believe it was passed on um, with the book of Colossians because Philemon was a slaveholder and a wealthy man in the church of Colossae. And he had a slave named Decimus, whose name, ironically enough, means useful, who stole money from him probably and fled to Rome. While in Rome, Paul was there. Onesimus meets up with Paul and becomes a Christian. Philemon is already a Christian. And now Onesimus comes to this realization. Now, now think about how serious faith this is. Onesimus ran away because obviously living with Philemon wasn't fabulous. Can we agree on that? If you flee 500 miles to get away from somebody, probably living with them wasn't fabulous. He becomes a Christian and he realizes the God of order respects and requires his people to respect the orders of human life because it's better than disorder and because there is some divine grace in it. And so Paul goes, in essence, I don't know how to tell you this, but you've got to go back to Philemon. Under Greco-Roman law, the penalty for that is death. Philemon can kill him, right? But Paul sends this letter along. And if you don't have a sense, if you can't laugh at this, you don't have a sense of humor, okay? I'm going to start in verse 8. So Paul is writing this to Philemon, and it's mainly about this slave that's accompanied this letter back. He says, Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do this, to do what you ought to do, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. I then, as Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I'm an old man, and a prisoner. I'm in jail, right? I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Meaning, he came to Christ, right? And if Paul led him to Christ, Paul's his spiritual father. So now Onesimus is Paul's son, right? Guess who else is Paul's son in the faith? Philemon is, right? Formerly, he was useless to you. Note the pun on the name. But now he has become useful both to you and to me. I'm sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. I love that one. You really should be here, Philemon, taking care of me and helping me. I mean, it's like a Jewish mom, isn't it? I mean, it's—I it's, <laughs> have a Jewish mother-in-law, so I can say that, I think. Ita- I have an Italian mom. It's like an Italian mother, right? Right? He said, you should be here, but since you won't be here and help me as your father in the faith, I wish I could have kept an Esmus, but I'm sending him back to you, right? He says, but I didn't want to do anything without your consent— so that any favor you do will be spontaneous and not forced. You see the pun there on slavery? He's saying, I'm not going to make you a slave by making your decisions for you. I want to make sure anything you do is out of spontaneity and generosity, because the gospel is about spontaneity, liberty, and generosity. You you do what's good, what's beautiful. You just do it, right? He's like, I'm not going to make you a slave, so I'm giving you your slave back. Right? Verse 15, perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. You see how he appealed to his humanity and to the divine spiritual relationship Philemon has with him. Do you see what he's doing? He's not only undermining the logic of the divine concession of slavery, he's also creating empathy and relationship so that Philemon can't be a caricature. You see, when you only think of people in terms of what they are to you or what you don't like about them, they lose their humanity and they become a one-dimensional caricature, right? They're a Democrat. They're a Republican. They're gay, right? They're Italian. They don't like sushi. Like, whatever it is. It's like, it's a thing you don't you, you either— or they're like, well, they're my butler, or they, that's, that's the guy who does my dry cleaning, or— they're either, they, they're just the thing they give you, or they're the thing you don't like about them. And when you do that, you don't see them as a whole person who, like, might like the Packers or might hate the Bears. But you see them as, like, this, this, just this one thing, and that's all they are. And when you do that, you mark my words, you will oppress them. You will start with a soft form of oppression, where you're sort of just, like, moving around their rights a little bit and not being generous and sort of taking away what you can, and it will eventually progress towards harder forms of oppression. Because they're not human to you. But the minute you're with them, and they're a brother, and you have to talk with them, and there's a a human empathy that's created, especially by a renewed heart, where you're just going to want to help them. It's so funny. I've I've worked with Christians. In the South, like, the the county I worked in was, like, almost, like, 
It voted 90-something percent for George W. Bush the first time, okay? Very conservative area, right? But when I took people from my church who hated welfare, they're like, just, I hate the government, hate welfare. You take them down to work with, like, homeless people, right? And, and you're like, hey, we're going to feed people, and they're going to get food, and then you're going to talk, we're just going to talk, right? Before you knew this, you're kind of like, yeah, you know, Bill, the homeless guy's coming over to my house on Wednesday. We're going to have ribs. Like, it's like, you're like, I thought, what? The minute they got to know somebody, they wanted to help. Because that's what human empathy does, right? And then the last thing is he built godliness in both groups. And don't underestimate that. If you look at what he says, he says to the slaves, he's like, listen, quit thinking you're working for a master. You're not. You're working for God. You belong to God. You're working for God. God's going to reward you. You're not working for that guy. Quit acting like when he's looking at you, you should work, and when he's not. No, if you're an employee, right? Work hard. Line his pockets. Try to make him fabulously wealthy. Because you're working for God, not men. And then he turns to the master and goes, listen, well, who do you think you are and what do you think you're doing? Right? And another, in, in Ephesians, he says to the master, he says, listen, just so you remember, don't threaten your slaves because you have a master in heaven who's way better at threatening than you could ever imagine. <laughs> I like that one? I love that one. This is a, just sober. You're like, oh, yeah, you're, you're kind of right about that. That sense of being under authority. So he, he undermines the philosophy of it he creates empathy between the human beings and he builds godliness. That destroys the institution. By the time the church was in its second century, it was the only institution in the world that was freeing thousands of slaves under Roman anti-freedom laws. One of the greatest acts of piety that could, you could do in the early church was to free a slave at a church worship service in front of the bishop. You would free your slaves and the bishop would bless you. And it was considered one of the greatest acts of piety that you could have. By the time of Constantine and his conversion, he had to convert because he would have had to kill his mother otherwise, because Helen had already converted. And in 315, he, um, he made the first capital penalty in the Roman Empire for people who stole people into slavery, for slave trading. And then a in five-something, I can't remember which one, Justinian got enough pressure from the church that he eradicated all laws for freeing slaves. Now, you might think, well, 500 years? That took forever. Think of the social unrest. Up to half the empire was slaves. And now anybody can do whatever they want. There's no social institutions for this. There's no economy for this. There's no function for this. You don't have magistrates to hold you. I mean, what's going to happen? I mean, nobody knows what's going to happen. And yet, he did it. In the history of the world, it has been Christians that have been on the vanguard of anti-slavery everywhere. There have been some secular people involved. All of their muscle was Christians. The mass they led was always Christians, almost always evangelicals, people who believed in the gospel and the Bible. You'd be like, well, wait a second, there are lots of people who fought for their freedom. Yes, fought for their freedom. There's only one group of people that has historically fought for the freedom of others. And it's been the church. It's been Christians. Now listen, you didn't do that. You didn't do that. Our forefathers and mothers in the faith did that. Not you. Not me. So we can be happy about it. We can be like, hey, you know, our team has eight championships. Yeah, well, great, you know. But the question is, how does the gospel change us? How do we treat people differently? What prejudice or bigotry of ours is undermined by the gospel? Who do we shield ourselves from so that we can keep them as caricatures so that we don't have to relate to them? And in what ways would godliness change the way we treat people within the divine concessions and the order and roles and structures and authority in which we either are subject or rule? If the gospel doesn't fundamentally transform that, the gospel has not fundamentally transformed you. But it can. It can. It can change us dramatically personally. It can change our families, the church, and our work, the divine institutions. But it can also reform deeply the divine concessions in all their forms. And many of them, like things like government and so on, we're probably going to be with till Jesus comes back and there's a better government. And so you can believe it's wonderful and be wrong, or you can believe there's nothing good about it and be wrong, or you can trust Jesus, realize that it's pretty bad, it's better than the alternative, and we should work to reform it as best we can. And that's true not just of government, but all the institutions of divine concession that exist in our lives, and there are many of them. But it only happens when you believe, and I believe, that there was only one master who became a slave for the liberation of all people. And either you belong to him or you don't. You need full liberation from the power of sin, from the penalty of sin, from the brokenness of sin, and ultimately from 
sin in the creative order that we need to be redeemed out of, and only Jesus' death and resurrection can provide that for you. You have to trust in him. But when you do, one of the things you'll never be able to be less than is like him, and he is the great liberator of all people. And that's just not, I don't think that should just make you social action girl or guy, but caring about that in its proper proportion and being transformed for it to matter what people, how treat, people treat other people should matter to us. Let me give you one quick example and then we'll pray. Do you care as much about the Kurdish sect that's being trapped in a city so that they can be killed by ISIS as much as the Christians who have been hurt and killed by ISIS? Or are they just another one of those groups of people between Paris and Tokyo that you don't know about and you only hear about when people are killing them? Do we care about the religious freedom of Sunnis where there are Shiite majorities? Or Shiites where there are Sunni majorities? Or Kurds? Or, or do we only care about Christians being persecuted? This is, depends on how much the gospel has changed us. If we care about the liberation of Christians, what does that say about us? And you see, if that's never occurred to you, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying it can. I'm saying the gospel can do something in us where we actually care about our enemies. And there's a beauty to that that will transform all kinds of things, but it'll start by transforming us. And it will have a beauty that only comes when you follow the master that became a slave. And when you become the servant of all and you seek to be the liberator one who is used by the greater liberator that is Jesus. Okay, we gotta stop. Let's pray. Father, thanks um, for um, this stuff. Let's just put it at that. I pray that whatever I've said that's been harmful or hurtful or that's been wrong, um, I just want to confess my real fallibility, but Father, I've said what I've said in earnest, and I pray that what is good in it that you would impress on the hearts and consciences of, of us all. And help us to be a people who care and who don't rest on the laurels of moments in church history where the church is decently good, but remember the places, the times that that's, there's just far, far too few of those moments and that we wish there were so many more of them and we wish to make one in this day. Holy Spirit, please help us to see our bigotries. Help us to see the places where we give ourselves the right to trample on other people and help us to be a liberator like Jesus is. First from sin, death, and hell in the gospel, but then that gospel to work itself out in all the orders of the world and all its structures, authority, roles, and rules. We want to be a people for good. Help us. Pray in Jesus' name.